Okay, everybody, welcome back again. Good morning. Hope you guys are doing good. There's about five minutes until 8.30. So for now, we're just kind of getting the stream set up. And hope you guys get comfortable, and we'll be ready to go in just a few, bit, a few minutes. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> hey, Jesse. Hi, Yelka. Good to see you guys. <clears throat> Hi, Gazi. Hope you guys slept good. <laughs> kind of nice this is on YouTube right so like you don't have to worry about a camera if I was a student in this class just me the way I my sleeping habits I'm such a big sleeper I would probably like wake up 15 20 minutes before the class and then just turn on my computer and start watching but for me of course as the professor you know I'm on camera so I got to be up like at least an hour before kind of get presentable <laughs> but nice welcome back Kayla good to see you too <clears throat> Hey, Gabriel. Peachy says hi. She's just hanging out with me here. <clears throat> Good girl, Peach. She's such a good kitty. I mean, I know I've said it a million times, but I just can't get enough of this cat. Seems like the feeling's kind of mutual. She just lays around. I have two cats, Jesse. I have, uh, well, her brother, Eddie. He's a little more camera shy, though. He doesn't come out as often, but he's also a big sweetheart. He's a good amount bigger than his sister here. Uh, he's got a couple of different markings, too. Yeah, but they're a lot of fun. <clears throat> Good morning. Hey there, Angel, Dan, all the rest. Welcome back. Hey, Caleb. Angel. Good to see you guys. Good morning, Delilah. Um, no, no other pets right now. Uh, let's see, had a dog before, um, and, and she passed away. So I actually had some older pets that both passed away last year. Um, Daisy, the dog and my old cat, Kitty, <laughs> but, um, now I have these two little guys and they're the best. Hey there, Ryan. Hi, Leslie. <clears throat> Cam. Welcome back, hi Nicole. Hey John. Okay, let's go Peachy. Time to work. That's one thing I'll definitely miss. Um, there are not a lot of things that I'll miss about the pandemic, but being able to lecture with my cats all hanging out, that'll be kind of something I miss a little bit. 
<clears throat> okay, hi guys, good to see you. Hi Rohin, Mo Monica, Veronica. <clears throat> Just a couple seconds here. It was a good weekend. I didn't do a lot. Just kind of laid low, um, some grading, and uh, <clears throat> other than that, I don't know, just did some workouts and stuff, staying active with my running routine. Okay, guys, welcome back. Good to see everybody here. It's 8.30, so I'm just going to let us get started. Um, thanks again. I hope you all had a good weekend and uh, are having a good time in your other classes, too, so far this semester. If you haven't had a chance yet, as usual, just go ahead and... Um, place a comment in the chat. That'll be my way of keeping tabs on who's been attending and stuff like that. Um, okay, so let's just kind of take stock of where we are right now in our schedule through the term. We're, we're totally on schedule if you look at the syllabus and the dates listed there in the calendar. So this is not anything new, but it's just kind of an update reminder, you know, of where we're at. So last time we, uh, well, we didn't meet on Thursday, but you guys took your first quiz. I'm working through the grading of those quizzes. I just need a few more days because I have a couple of other classes and some other grading assignments I'm also getting through. But um, I'll be finishing those in the next couple of days, and then I'll be able to notify you guys through Titanium when I'm ready with the grades. Um, also, you guys know that I messaged you before about the previous homework assignment. That one I did grade, and that's been done. Um, and I said in the Titanium message that anyone looking for their individual score, you know, I posted the answer key. But anybody who's looking for their individual score and wants more detail on their assignment, just email me, and I'll reply back to any emails I get within a 48 hours maximum. So my, my method is that I prefer students to request their scores so that we have a kind of ongoing dialogue and a connection. So um, no, I don't post them anywhere, but you will be able to find them from me anytime you want. And about maybe 20 or so of the students in my critical thinking class here have. Uh, but there's still some that haven't, so at any time, feel free. Or if you want, you can just wait until I'm done with the quiz grades and ask for them both at the same time, but it's totally up to you. So just that's one thing to know. We're done with the first quiz and the first homework. And I see all you guys um, arriving to the meeting, so it's good to see everybody that's showing up here. Um, thank you guys for your attendance. Okay, so the next thing that's coming up after you know the last um, quiz is the midterm. That's not going to happen until, let me look at the date here in the calendar. Um, yeah, so midterm is Thursday, March 11th, so um, this is Tuesday, February the um, 23rd, and so that's, what, two weeks and two days. So we've got still um, 16 days to get prepared for the midterm, and we have two more chapters in the book to go over. So the plan is this week we're going to have two lectures on Chapter 3 which is all about language and communication. Next week, we have two lectures on chapter four, which is all about knowledge and the limits of human knowledge. And then um, week seven, we have a review session on Tuesday. I'll give you guys the study guide so you can get prepared for the review session before. And then Thursday the 9th, that's the day of the uh, exam itself. Okay, so just a couple of key dates to keep in mind as we go through the remaining part of the semester, obviously just to kind of think uh, about the dates and know what to expect. Okay, so the plan this week is chapter three. Let's go into chapter three, but before I do that, um, there was one more vocabulary item that I don't think I maybe went through uh, in chapter one, and it's something important, um, so I didn't want to leave it out. Obviously, we didn't ask you about it or anything on the quiz, but for the midterm and other stuff that comes later, I might throw in a question on this. So um, remember when we all talked about what are like different barriers to critical thinking, what are some of the obstacles that bad mental habits that we sometimes establish which prevent us from being better critical thinkers. Um, we talked about, you know, like avoidance and denial, anger, um, <clears throat> ignorance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one more of those just to add to the uh, vocabulary from that chapter, another barrier to critical thinking is confirmation bias. So let me just mention this really fast. One more term to add to our previous chapter one notes. Um, so confirmation bias, it's a word maybe some of you've heard, um, but if you haven't, then I'm gonna tell you about it right now. 
Confirmation bias is when a person only seeks information that reinforces or backs what they already believe. So it's kind of like a bias in favor of confirming your existing uh, beliefs and opinions. So let me write that here. Actually, good girl. <laughs> okay, so confirmation bias. <clears throat> Okay, confirmation bias. Uh, one only seeks information that confirms their established views. Um, so it's a bias in favor of your own opinions. It's a bias in the pursuit of information about your views. Only looking at the information that tends to confirm what you already think is true. So it's like a person who, um, when they investigate information on a topic, they only look at information that adds support to what they already think. They never look at the other side of the debate or um, contrary evidence. So like for example, suppose that someone um, had confirmation bias and they would believe in flat earth. You know, they think that the earth is a flat disk instead of a sphere in, in space. If this person's a flat earther and they have confirmation bias, then let me ask this question just to make sure you guys are following me. Um, where do you think this person would go if they were going online to like search out information on the question, is the earth flat? If a person had confirmation bias and they're already a believer that the earth is flat, then what would their internet search look like as they seek out facts and details on this question? This type of person would go to sources like what? <clears throat> flat earth society, good, yeah, that's right. So. Correct, Ghazi. They would only seek out information that confirms what they already believe. So, you know, they would dig out into the dark corners of the Internet, um, you know, Internet forums, blogs, unscientific um, conspiracy theory websites, which just try to promote the same idea and never look at the wealth of scientific, credible evidence to the contrary. So confirmation bias is a big problem, and I think it's a bigger problem today than at any previous time in human history. Here's why. Because with the advent of the internet and the you know information age that we're living in, there's so much stuff out there that a person can basically um, tailor their information diet to whatever it is they already think. Um, so if you know if you're like a conspiracy theorist and you think the moon landing was false, you can find some internet community out there that agrees with you and that will boost up and reinforce that false belief. If you're a person who thinks, you know, anything under the sun, there's going to be some corner of the internet where there's a small community at least, and maybe a large or moderate sized community of people who think the same thing. So if you had grown up generations ago, like in the time of your grandparents or something, suppose you're living in 1950, where are you going to go to find information on the shape of the earth? There's no internet. There's no conspiracy theory, dark web internet or anything like that. So you can only find information from the same credible sources where everybody gets the information from. And these algorithms are also a big problem too, Ghazi, and that's a very insightful comment. You know, these things try to serve us the content that they think that we want. They're hunting for clicks. And so if they see that a person is going into these kind of avenues online, then they try to put more of it in your news feeds, timelines, et cetera, um, sponsored ads that you see, because they're trying to get you to click more and spend more time on their websites and their web hosting services. So um, in a way, it creates the possibility for people to be living in a world of their own information and facts, completely cut off from um, objective reality. So, you know, we used to have a common set of facts and a common set of information. You know, the newspapers of the day, the, the professional journalism of the day would, would be the information you'd have to refer to. But nowadays, people can, can divide into little encampments um, of their own belief system. So we have to try our best to overcome the tendency towards confirmation bias. You shouldn't be so wedded, so committed 
to your established views that you cannot possibly face challenges to them or at least investigate information which tends to you know, um, contradict it. Um, yeah, The Social Dilemma on Netflix does talk a lot about that. I haven't seen the full film, but I've watched some clips and I know um, that that is what it's about. That's something that we'll come back to a little later in the class too when we talk about the media and the internet. That's a later lesson in the class. But for now anyway, confirmation bias. Just let's add that to our roster of vocabulary terms from chapter one. Okay guys, so just wanted to mention that. Let's go, out, go on now because we want to start with um, the next chapter of the book today. And that's chapter three, okay? <clears throat> so chapter three is all about language and communication. Language and communication. So I know it's open really fast here. <clears throat> okay. So, um, Chapter one opened with some discussion of those famous social psychology experiments to bring like a little bit of a human element and something relatable to the discussion of critical thinking and how it has value. Chapter three also opens with reference to um, some recent political history uh, to kind of, I guess, give a lesson to the reader about how important good communication and the effective um, use of communication and language can, can matter a lot and can be very important too. So they give an example of the whole Benghazi scandal from 2012. I don't know if you guys are too aware of the details of the whole Benghazi episode. A lot of the discussion and um, controversy followed the events back in 2012. It was a minor controversy, uh, I guess, but um, it's mentioned at the top of chapter three. So I'll just go over some of the basic details there. Forgive me if you already know some of this stuff or if you're a follower of recent um, events in US history, you probably would know some of this, but anyway. Um, in uh, So Barack Obama's first term, there were a lot of uh, protest movements happening in different parts of um, the Middle East and the Muslim world. Um, the rise of social media was helping to facilitate um, social movements of peaceful protests where people were basically marching in the streets, agitating for um, political reform and democratic reform. In some of these countries that I'm mentioning, Egypt, uh, etc., there were longstanding dictators and autocratic rulers. And I guess people, um, you know, had started to yearn more and more for a democratic system of government where people had a vote and a voice. So there were these protests happening. The, the label given in the West to this movement that was sort of spreading throughout that region was the Arab Spring. The, that's supposed to evoke the thought of like, it's a new season, it's a springtime, now we're going to have the, the green shoots of democracy taking root in these parts of the world, but not always been hospitable to democracy. So leaders were being overthrown, um, and the United States was in support of this because we are trying to be, um, you know, uh, supportive of constitutional democratic reforms. So anyway, the Arab Spring was happening. Now in Libya, there was a dictator, military dictator that had ruled for a long time in Libya, and that's another um, country in the Middle East. Libya was ruled by Muammar Gaddafi, who, who's kind of like a military general that seized power, and he had sit, he had, uh, you know, he had had the seat of power for about 30 years. Finally, though, during the Arab Spring, you know, the people of Libya were starting to rise up, protest in the streets, and demand his ouster and the establishment of a democratic system. Well. In his case, he was, you know, bitterly opposed to the um, democratic um, and popular protests. So he was really threatening to crush them with overwhelming force. He was preparing to send in the military and even to perhaps launch airstrikes on masses of crowds gathering in streets, um, urging for reform. So, you know, if he had done that, imagine, you know, using your own military against your people just because they're protesting, this could have led to a total humanitarian disaster and a huge loss of civilian life. So um, the United States with, under the President Barack Obama, decided that we're not going to tolerate that. So we basically led a coalition of allies to engage in our own airstrikes against Gaddafi and to um, give power and momentum to the protesters. What that ended up causing to happen was um, because of our military intervention, 
the protest movement actually was able to capture Gaddafi and they basically an angry mob killed him in the street. So then he's gone, right? Um, by the way, this is all happening during the um, presidential election of 2012 between Obama and Mitt Romney. So that's kind of a political subtext in the background. Okay, so then um, <clears throat> there's a little bit of more detail now. Gaddafi's been ousted. So the country of Libya is a little bit, you know, its political leadership has been decapitated. So it's kind of unstable, obviously. You don't have a functioning uh, government yet established to take the place of Gaddafi. So there's a great potential for violence, instability, and all of that. Um, now, the United States, obviously, we have diplomatic embassies all around the world um, where we have staff working to try and facilitate negotiations um, and diplomacy between the United States and whatever other countries we deal with. And so we had a diplomatic uh, mission um, in Libya, and uh, it was in Benghazi, Libya, okay? And so we have our embassy there in Benghazi. Now, at the same time, as all these things were happening, a film had been produced in the United States, okay? There was a movie that had been made in the United States, not by the United States, not affiliated with the U.S. government, not representative of the people or anything, but there was a private filmmaker, some guy I think in Hollywood, and he made a movie, an independent film about the Prophet Muhammad, you know, of the religion of Islam. And the way that the movie was, was it was supposed to be like a very harsh takedown of his character and his historical legacy. So it was like portraying him as very much like a warlike and um, deviant and fraudulent and all these other things. And so if you know a little bit about um, the religion, and I don't think it takes too much imagination to understand this. It's considered very offensive to launch these attacks on the Prophet Muhammad. It would be like people, you know, attacking the figure of Jesus Christ in, in the West or something. But perhaps even more um, intensified because of how uh, sacred and, um, and revered the figure of Muhammad is. So anyway, this was causing protests around the Muslim world. Uh, some people were encircling our embassies saying this movie was wrong, we demand that it be, you know, removed or people apologize for it. And um, so anyway, that was the state of play. There were some protesters then gathering at the compound in Benghazi. And um, there was a little bit of a debate in the echelons of uh, leadership in the United States. Should we depict these protesters as violent, perhaps terrorists bent on attacking our uh, di diplomats and facilities? Or should we instead have a conciliatory message saying this film has nothing to do with the United States and we're sorry that it exists. It doesn't represent our attitudes towards um, Muslim people or the religion of Islam. Um, so what the administration decided and uh, under the supervision of uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton of the U.S. State Department, that we were going to try and dial down the tensions and de-escalate a little bit by distancing the United States from the film and portraying the protesters as peaceful and just righteously aggrieved at the content of the movie. But anyway, what ended up happening, so now we get to the real punchline. What ended up happening is the uh, protesters in Benghazi actually did um, end up uh, with a violent assault on the compound, and that ended up causing death uh, to some of our own diplomatic personnel over there. So the point that's being made by the textbook editor is that in this case, uh, poor communication actually resulted in there being a shortage of room for evacuated casualties and a lack of appropriate contingency planning in the event that people needed to be evacuated and security reinforcements had to be deployed. So it just sort of gives us the case that um, the general communication given that protests rather than violent militant activity was causing the unrest contributed to the lack of the preparedness. So. Um, a lot, I think, was made of the Benghazi events in a way. I don't want to overplay it because some people have gone, I think, too far on the other side saying that, you know, uh, there was some, like, intention to mislead the people about the nature of the events. I think it was just a, a bad judgment call or whatever, not nefarious or indicative of any kind of bad political motives. But it does remind us, though, that communication, especially when important things like life and property and safety are on the line, uh, they really do matter a lot. And also in the more everyday circumstances that we find ourselves in, we want to be good and effective communicators. And that's a part of good critical thinking. So good communication skills involve keeping a dialogue open, being clear, being precise, 
and being responsive in a timely way um, with your side of the communicative interaction. Um, so in this lecture and in the one that follows on Thursday, we will discuss some of the important aspects of language, the relationship that it has to critical thinking. We'll talk about um, different functions of language, what language is, what are some different types of definitions, and what are different forms of meaning in language. We'll distinguish um, some different communication styles, and we'll also learn about how language can be used to manipulate people through the use of rhetoric. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what we're going to do now on Tuesday and Thursday this week. So let's get started with some vocabulary. First of all, what is language? That we have to, of course, understand, since that's our talk topic for now. <clears throat> so language. Basically, um, as you guys all know, language is a system of communication, and it's a system of communication that involves symbols, which can be of three different possible kinds. It can be spoken, like the sounds that I'm making right now, okay? Or they can be written symbols, like this isn't a sound, but it's a set of uh, inscriptions on a board or on a page. By vision, you see those symbols and you know what the content is. Um, and another form of symbols that language involves can be nonverbal, like body language, hand gestures, or even sign language, right? Sign language is neither um, symbols on a page nor is it sounds that you hear, but it's another form of symbolic representation. Of language. So there we go, language, a system of communication system of communication that involves a set of symbols, which can be either spoken, written, or nonverbal. So um, <clears throat> language is a fascinating thing. Philosophically, it's a very rich subject matter because um, it's really what makes us this advanced life form that we are. Language is what separates us from all the other animals. Um, because we have language, we can preserve ideas and information and pass them down from generation to generation, from person to person. So how is it that you have inherited the knowledge, right, that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776 because you weren't there and that happened hundreds of years ago? It's because written, um, uh, you know, records of these things have been preserved in our history books and documents and passed on through language, speech, and writing to us and so on to the next generation. Uh, but a cow or a cat or a dog or any other animal besides a human walking around on the planet Earth right now has no knowledge of the facts of history, astronomy, chemistry, physics, philosophy, and so forth. Now, animals can somewhat communicate through sounds and vocalizations in some cases, right? Like an animal can roar at you or make a sound of um, pain or fear in some cases. Um, you've all heard, you know, your pets and stuff make those kinds of noises, but they don't bear symbolic content. So there's no grammar, there's no syntax to those sounds. So they don't have any kind of stable meaning. Just as an example, right? If I say right now, imagine in your mind a cow standing on the surface of the moon. It's like um, you can't even help but think of that just because you're interpreting my speech. But I, there's no sounds, symbols, or anything that I could show to any non-human animal that would induce that visual image in its mind. So language gives us uh, powers of knowledge and uh, control of our environment, far surpassing those of other creatures. Um, not to worry, Tucker, I see you there. Um, and I see also, Brianna, you said you had some Wi-Fi issues, but don't worry. Sometimes um, mobile data works just as well, I don't know, depending on, I guess, the bandwidth of your phone. I just got a 5G phone this weekend, actually, so I'm kind of a little bit geeking out on that. But they're very fast. It's almost like I don't really need Wi-Fi anymore. Maybe I should just use it as a hotspot and run my other devices off of it. But anyway, yeah, so we're just doing our best. The videos are all archived, too. So if something gets lost for a bit, you can come back and watch the replay at any later time. Okay, so just language. Um, human language is social. We're born into it, obviously. Um, 
Another fascinating aspect of language when we talk about these symbols that it involves is that the actual symbols used are totally arbitrary and conventional, meaning that there's no essential need for one given symbol to designate a specific uh, con uh, definition or concept. So like take the word dog in English. You all know that when I say that, I'm referring to that familiar type of mammalian canine species, right? The man's best friend, dog. If I say a different sound, pero, you know, to a Spanish speaker, this is the same thing. It's not a different uh, object being referred to, but it sounds different, dog versus pero, or if German, hund. You know, these three sounds are different sounding sounds, but they all refer to one of the same objects. So that gives you the idea uh, that the nature of what a word refers to can be captured by any arbitrary, arbitrarily selected symbol. The same with written symbols, right? In English, you know how the letters D-O-G look on the page. But if we were looking at the word that refers to dogs in Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, obviously the symbol that is used to show that uh, concept is looking different visually. But um, we can have a common reference even though these symbols are different. Obviously, there are many different world languages that sound and appear differently visually or um, acoustically. And it, we can imagine a counterfactual timeline of human history where far different sounds and symbols were used to establish reference to the same things. Imagine a different world uh, in which we had just, for whatever reason, chosen to use a completely different set of sounds in reference to the same things. You don't even necessarily have to engage in this counterfactual reasoning because you can just look around the actual world and see that many different cultures and civilizations have used different sounds and symbols to refer to the same content. So that's a fascinating thing about language. The carrier of the information, the sounds and symbols themselves, in a way don't matter as long as we all agree on what they are going to be, and then we have a language. Um, now there was a famous, there still is actually, he's still alive, famous linguist and philosopher Noam Chomsky. His position on language is that there's, some, there's something universal about it. Um, today, he's somewhat, somewhat more widely known as like a political commentator and theorist, but his original work in philosophy was all about linguistics. And um, he has a well-known theory in linguistics called universal grammar. In, in Chomsky's view, although the surface differences of all the languages are there, as I mentioned, um, he thinks they all obey an underlying common grammar structure, you know, like subject, predicate, noun, verb, and all of that. Um, most people, I think, adhere to Chomsky's view that universal grammar is a real thing, but there are some that don't. Some people say if you look very hard, you go into certain, like, I don't know, indigenous cultures, far into, like, Amazon rainforest or something, where the language user group is very small, you can find some very atypical languages that seem to deviate from common structure of grammar that many world languages do have. Um, but at any rate, that's a debated point, and it, we don't need to take either side, just kind of trying to let you know about that, the existence of those debates. Okay, so the next thing in chapter three that is discussed are what are some different functions of language? What are different things that language can be used to, to do? Um, so they talk about four functions of language. <clears throat> Okay, so um, one of those four functions is simply the informative function of language. So with the informative function of language, a person just um, makes statements that uh, are either true or false, to, to make statements that are either true or false. <clears throat> Okay, so that's perhaps the primary function of language to, to provide information that can be judged or determined to be true or false. Um, so remember earlier, way back in like one of our first meetings, I talked to you guys about what are different types of sentences, and that now comes back to play a little bit because um, assertoric sentences fit with this concept of the informative function of language. Assertoric sentences are just sentences that are either true or false. And so when you 
make assertions, now you're engaged in the informative function of language. So <clears throat> usually you hope that when you pass along information, you pass along true information. You know, So if I say to somebody, Sacramento is the capital of California, I'm telling them something true. That's, that's correct. Um, but suppose that I'm misinformed myself, like I don't know the facts. Suppose that I think San Francisco is the capital of California, and I pass that information along. It's still an informative, uh, it's still the informative function of language, except in this case I'm misinforming someone by giving them false information. Um, now sometimes people pass false information along because they themselves are confused or deceived or um, unaware of the facts, right? So like if somebody says, um, Sac Sacramento, sorry, uh, San Francisco is the capital of California, they're maybe not correctly informed. The person may deliberately try to misinform people by deceiving them on purpose. Like someone says um, they've been cheating on their partner and they say, you know, I would never cheat on you. And they're telling them they didn't do it. That's false information, I guess, in that case, but they're doing it deliberately. So sometimes you misinform and sometimes you deceive on purpose. But for the most part, we hope as good critical thinkers that we hold on to the truth that we pass along truth to others, and that we scrutinize information that comes into us so we make sure we don't believe things that are false. Okay, so that's the informative function of language. Um, aside from that, there's also the directive function of language. The directive function of language has to do with imperatives. Remember we talked about those, which are commands that you give. So directive language is to use imperatives to direct or influence people's actions. <clears throat> to use imperatives, commands in other words, <clears throat> to direct or influence behavior or actions. Okay, so sometimes the function of language is not to inform, but rather to direct people. If I say to somebody, um, get out of the car, I'm not trying to inform them of anything, but I'm trying to get them to do something that I want them to do, an action of getting out of the car, or um, hold the door, um, wait for me, um, uh, take out the trash, um, get out of bed, uh, move. You know, These would all be directive functions of language. And of course, sometimes we have to use our voice, our words, our language to engage other people in actions that we need for whatever the practical purposes at hand may be. So that's another function of language. It involves the use of imperatives. Sometimes we're in the world directing the behavior of others. Sometimes we are commanded by other people through directive language to do things ourselves. And that's another important function of language. If we didn't have that, if we were just animals that could make noises, imagine how much less coordination we could possibly have. All we could do is kind of like grunt, and, and like gesture at things a little bit, but a human being can give very detailed instructions. I could say to you, pick up the screwdriver, go and screw this thing into the wall, and you understand those concepts. So another important aspect of the human condition and the function of language is directive. There's also um, <clears throat> um, ceremonial language, okay? <clears throat> So the ceremonial function of language is basically language that is used in sort of like official or formal settings or situations. So Okay, so what it says there is um, ceremonial function, language when it's used in official or formal settings. Um, so the use of language in the ceremonial case is often, I mean, it's, it's not improvised. It's usually set down by um, customs and conventions uh, that revolve around that particular type of ceremony or official setting. Let's see if anyone here in the Tucker, uh, sorry, Tucker, Tripping, Tucker Ransom, hi, I saw your name there as I was about to make my own comment, but um, let me ask you guys here in the chat, does anybody think you can consider an idea or an example of a ceremonial use of language? 
um, you know, like what's a case that matches this definition? The use of language, but it's in some type of official or formal setting. And when people are speaking in this case, there's sort of like a tradition or a custom that governs the way they're using words. So let's see if anyone, I have some things I could add to our discussion, but let's see if any students have something to throw in. <clears throat> Ceremonial language, anybody? What do you think could be a case? It's okay to take a wild guess. <clears throat> okay, yeah, there you go, Gossi. That would be one, the Pledge of Allegiance, right? When you're giving the pledge, there's a certain order of words. We all know what they are, or, I mean, most of us, I guess. Um, speaking with your boss or someone of authority, that could be um, the case, Nicole, but it depends. You can have an informal conversation with the coworker or boss, uh, but if it's someone of authority, I think, depending on the scenario, like what if it's a job interview, right, and there are specific official questions that you have to answer, and you have to maintain this kind of polite demeanor, this professional demeanor, that could be a case for sure. Marriage, wedding, good, yeah, wedding vows. Do you take this person to love, honor, and obey uh, till the death do you part? Um, I do, right? Well, that whole exchange is formal. It's um, routine. It's not something that people are making up on the spot or just kind of freestyling as they go along, right? That's another case. Good. Um, I would think of legal contexts. If you're in a courtroom, graduation ceremony, yes. The, the reading of names, the um, presentation perhaps of the keynote speech. Um, yeah, in a court of law, like the, the, the lawyers, the judge, and even those entering their plea, you know, um, how do you plead? Um, not guilty, your honor, right? When you say that, we know that there's a customary way of using language in that particular proceeding. I can think also of like Miranda rights that could be read to a person being arrested on the street. Um, um, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can or will be used against you in a court of law. This is something that's an official statement given to people to inform them of their constitutional rights pre-trial. Um, prayer, you say, Gabriel? Um, sure, like the Lord's Prayer perhaps could be one of those cases, but that's something that people say in their own private settings usually. So unless it's like maybe in a church, um, I could imagine um, a homily or a prayer or sermon being given where the people are expected to participate in a specific kind of official way. Quintanera, yes, um, but I don't know what's the speech act um, that's noted and uh, formally um, recognized in a quintanera. I haven't participated in one myself full um, disclosure, so but I take it as a given that you're correct. Okay, so um, ceremonial language, good. Just wanted a little bit of back and forth with you guys. So one more function, I say there's four. We had space below for three, so I'm going to create a room up here for the last one. Um, one more function of language that's mentioned in the book, anyway, is expressive language. Expressive language is um, when you use language to communicate or to convey feelings and emotions, feelings and attitudes, and um, it's used to bring about an emotional reaction or impact on whoever hears what you're saying or um, whatever the audience of, of the communication is. So um, <clears throat> expressive language communicates feelings and attitudes. Um, and is used to bring about an emotional impact on the hearer. So it says expressive function communicates feelings and attitudes, and is used to bring about an emotional impact. Um, so an example of like expressive use of language could be um, song lyrics or poetry. And let's just take the example of song lyrics for a moment. Um, hearing a song, it's not that the song is trying to tell you like literal information or facts, right? And it's also not like asking you or directing you to do anything specific. Of course, song is not listened to, at least in the general course, as an official ceremonial type of event. 
So what the song does achieve, though, is conveying the kind of vibe or mood of the song's content to you. So if this is like a sad song about a breakup or something, then maybe you kind of catch that sad, melancholy vibe from the way that the lyrics are constructed. If this is like a happy, upbeat, like kind of party song, then maybe you get that kind of sense, that kind of um, feeling, emotion, or attitude from the way that the lyrics are described in that sense. And there's also poetry, right? If you're reading one of the classic Shakespearean sonnets, it might convey to you the deep depths of love and passion that are trying to be communicated by means of the poetry. So poetry, song lyrics, um, and certain forms of prose can be seen as expressive language. Um, now that's another important function as well. I would say this too, I mean, the textbook doesn't mention it, but I would have thought inquiry should be one of the functions. I'm not gonna add it to the notes necessarily, but just thinking about it like critically. Sometimes when you use language, you're trying to inquire about information, you're asking questions. So um, maybe they thought that that could somehow be um, collapsed into one of the other categories, but in my view, it's a slight omission. Not, uh, nonetheless, um, these are different functions of language. Sorry, make sure that phone call, I don't know who that is, not to worry. Okay, so yeah, we've talked about the different functions of language. Now I can clear the board of this material. And I'm going to talk to you guys just for a little bit about nonverbal language. And I guess, appropriately enough, this discussion of nonverbal language, I'm not going to create a lot of written notes because it's something that I think is easier to talk through. So sometimes it's important to consider not just what you're saying, but how you're saying it. Um, nonverbal cues, like body language, tone of voice, can influence how people are interpreting what you communicate. You know, so the same message delivered in an angry tone can give a completely different reaction from an, uh, you know whoever you're interacting with if you said the same thing in a calm or a measured tone. Um, like where are we going tonight is much different from where are we going tonight. You know, so like um, you have to consider sometimes your own tone of voice, volume that you use, um, the pitch, etc. That's not necessarily the verbal content, but the way that you express it. Um, sometimes body language also can be useful to assist your communication. And a skilled communicator, which a good critical thinker usually is, is also able to deploy all the skills of um, nonverbal communication, hand gestures and so forth, body language, when they communicate verbally. So think, for example, of how the simple act of nodding when you say yes can bring about a greater um, sense of the affirmation of whatever you're saying yes to than if you just say yes in a flat voice and stare straight ahead. Um, so if somebody asks me a question, are you a professor? I'm like, oh yeah, sure, I am. It's much different than yes, you know, like, so the, the simple act of nodding. In another case, gesturing at something with your finger that you're trying to um, refer to in speech, like take a look at this um, sparkling water that's sitting over there. It's much easier for me to direct your attention to it through the simple act of pointing or gesturing than to say, um, to my direct left, there's a can of sparkling water. Why don't you look at that? You know, and so I'm not helping you at all with my body language in that case to get the same information across. Um, so be a skilled user of body language in order to convey information. As a professor, it, it, like uh, you know, it's the major part of my job to communicate information to students like you guys, like we're doing right now. And so I try my best to involve all of the assets that can facilitate effective communication, whether that's tone of voice, um, trying to sound engaging, trying to be steady and uh, clear and direct, um, and also just using my hands and stuff like that. Sometimes this makes the information pop a little bit more and come across a little bit more vividly. On the other hand, there's also a mention in the book of how your body language can sometimes betray when you're being deceptive, like when you're lying or trying to be dishonest. Um, I've heard it said, and it's mentioned in the book, that skilled um, investigators, detectives, law enforcement officers, judges, um, sometimes teachers, whoever, can detect telltale signs of dishonesty when someone is trying to deceive them. You know, so like if your tone of voice wavers, or you're shifting your gaze, or you cannot maintain eye contact, or you're fidgeting with your hands, you know, sometimes this may give off the message to the person that you're dealing with that you're trying to trick them or that you're not telling them the full honest truth. So be mindful of how your body language can um, send other messages aside from those that you're merely saying in your words or writing on the page. 
There's also mention about how, um, as we speak here about nonverbal use of language, the function, the effect of pictures and images in communication. That's another, I guess, case of nonverbal language because pictures don't involve speech. Um, <clears throat> there's a saying, maybe some of you have heard it, that pictures can uh, pick a picture's worth a thousand words, meaning that the power of one photo is in some cases much superior in its, its, its expressive quality and force than even a very detailed um, written um, message of the same information. And that's definitely true, right? Like, um, imagine that there was like a great earthquake that caused devastation to some place. And um, you heard about it, but just by reading about it. Uh, even if this was like a Pulitzer Prize winning, you know, journalist, and um, this is very, very vivid and, you know, uh, captivating writing. Oh, pe bodies were strewn around, rubble was everywhere, buildings were demolished, you know, um, pipes were burst and water was just shooting into the air. You hear that description or like of a war zone or something, perhaps in another case, and it might come across to you as something significant that you care about, but how much more powerful would the same scene be if you could just see a photo of it? Okay, so like journalism and media knows that a lot of times photos drive the story, and that's why a lot of times the headline image that you see on the cover of the newspaper or the website, whatever, um, can do a greater job at impressing upon people the significance of the story than the written content can. Now, we should use all the tools that we have at our disposal, written, spoken, uh, visual, and otherwise. And this is just a reminder that, yes, vision, uh, visual aids like photography or video can, of course, facilitate the con uh, transmission of information even more effectively. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was thinking, as I was just saying that, about the whole Zimbardo and the Milgram study. It's one thing for me to teach students about it just by reading from the textbook and hearing my lecture on it, but I think that's why I would wanted to share the videos with you, because seeing the videos makes it more real, it really hits differently when you actually see footage. Um, one last thing I'll say about photo and video is that you guys, your generation, this current young generation, I would say you're going to be one of the most skilled in all of history at using um, digital media, photo, and videos to communicate because you're already very skilled and versatile with the use of like memes, um, you know, all kinds of random postings, short videos, etc. cetera. Um, and in a lot of cases, a, a simple meme with like a characteristic trademark image that can then be like varied and slightly edited in every, ever so many different subtle little ways can get a point across more effectively than a much longer train of written dialogue. So you guys hopefully will take those skills into the world and, and make the best of them as good communicators. So we just have to be mindful of our um, verbal, written, and nonverbal uh, aspects of language. Try to be clear, and when you're interacting with another person, be willing to ask that person follow-up questions or for clarification. It's very important in language that you um, try to have a meeting of the minds and that you understand the other party which you can't do if you're never willing to say, hey, I didn't understand that. Could you clarify that for me? Or um, on that one point, I want to ask a follow-up question. So sometimes you have to really be willing to dig around a little bit um, and find out exactly what your uh, correspondent is saying. Because there's no real point of interaction verbally or otherwise if we come away from it without a clear understanding of the other party. In that case, why don't we just talk to ourselves, right? So. Um, you have to do your part to be a good listener, too, as well as a good communicator, because listening is half of communication. Okay, so next up, the book talks about um, some different types of meaning and then different types of definitions. So that's the next thing for us to go over. Um, so let me just add some information on this. Two types of meaning. Okay, so there is what they call denotative meaning. And on the other hand, connotative meaning. Okay, so the denotative meaning of a word is just the official meaning of the word, basically. It's just stating the essential attributes of the thing referred to by the term kind of like an official dictionary definition would do. Okay, so <clears throat> states essential attributes.
like an official dictionary definition. <clears throat> Now, contrasted against that, there's connotative meaning. And connotative meaning is meaning that um, is based on a person's past experiences and associations. So it's often not the literal meaning. Sometimes it's like a slang or a secondary meaning. Um, but they also say that connotative meaning, since it's based on this past experience and associations, it can be either positive or negative in, in connotation. So let me write that down. Um, <clears throat> Okay, connotative meaning based on past experience and associations and can be either positive or negative. Um, <clears throat> so let me give you an example that the book uses and then maybe we can give a few others on the same um, top topic. Take the one word dog, right? So this word, when you think about its denotative meaning, like what it officially just refers to, of course, that refers to the familiar um, mammalian species of domesticated canis familiaris. So, I mean, we can get into the physiology, um, the genetic features and morphology of dogs, and then we would be giving the denotative meaning of it, right? Like a, a standard specimen of canis familiaris. Um, but if you think of the same word dog as, as it could be assigned a connotative meaning, sometimes we use this word as a term of slang, right? So like you guys, I'm sure know, Sometimes a person may refer to one's friends or close associates as their dogs, like, yeah, I'm chilling with my dogs, that's what I'm doing on Saturday or whatever. And in that case, uh, you're not referring to literally hanging out with dogs, and that, if this is the example that I'm going with. Um, but what you're trying to draw on are the past experience and associations of dogs as being these like loyal companion animals, right? Man's best friend and all of that. So when you call your friends your dogs, you're, you're kind of faintly referring to some element of of what dogs represent to you. They represent to you companionship, loyalty, um, et cetera. In another case though, the same word dog could be used with a negative connotation. Like someone says men are just dogs or this person uh, was so, they're just so unattractive, they look like a dog. Like, so in cases like this, the person is trading on, let's go with men or dogs, right? Um, the experience and associations of dogs as being like animalistic, um, bestial, um, not capable of delaying gratification, but just going for the most immediate um, pleasure or whatever. So um, the same word can be used with this negative connotation or a positive connotation, or we could give its denotative meaning. Now, as I'm speaking of the uh, secondary and third meanings, et cetera, of the word dog, it's not as if they would not possibly appear in a dictionary. As you guys know, if you ever look at a dictionary, oftentimes you'll find a primary definition and then some ways further down, the like more informal or slang uses of the same word. So like if you looked up square, it might say like four-sided polygon, equilateral sides and all of that, um, interior angles, right angles. But then some ways down, it might say square, you know, like a person who's not hip or whatever, you know, like the old school slang term. Um, so I'm not saying that the connotative meaning of the term can never appear in the dictionary, but it's not its primary denotative meaning in, in each case, okay? Um, so, can anybody think of a word like that? Let's see if anyone has some examples. And I think you probably will have examples because young people like your age are like the masters of all things slang and etc. cetera. So, um, who has any idea or example of a word that has a literal denotative meaning, but has a kind of different connotative meaning that we see sometimes in slang? Um, I've got some thoughts. I could add some, but let's see if anyone here has something to put in there. Let me know. <clears throat> so, it, like, you know, as I just gave the example of dog, something sim along the same lines. There's a literal meaning, and then there's a kind of slang meaning or a connotative meaning that's different from that. What do you think? Let's see what you got. 
Okay, so Nicole, you say a rat. Cap or no cap, good. Okay, so you're going with the animal example, Nicole. I noticed that like a rat literally is that like familiar small mammalian rodent, but um, sometimes people call someone a rat if they're like a betray you or if they give up information to the authorities. Cap or no cap, right? Like so, um, yeah, it was, it was like so hot I almost died. No cap or whatever, or like it, it isn't cap, right? Cap, I guess, has now become a term in reference to like um, a person being deceptive or trying to withhold the truth. So no cap is like total honesty and just keeping it real. But obviously the word cap itself in a denotative sense could mean a hat that a person wears on their head or like a, a sealing device for some kind of um, vessel or whatever. So that's a good case. Anything else? Greatest hits, anything you guys got? These are two fine suggestions. If, if you've got those two, then I'm sure many others can come up with something as well. Maybe before we move on, one more. <clears throat> Rat, cap, no cap. I mean, what, there's the word lit. You guys use this word like as a, as a reference to everything being cool or like I'm lit, like I'm feeling great and I'm just like having a great time. Um, as opposed to igniting something that's combustible, right? Um, I mean, even a more common everyday word like cool, right? Cool as a term of denotation is just referring to the temperature condition of some environment. But cool in a positive connotation can be like, you know, a hip person that is unflappable. Um, or I guess you could also have a negative connotation with the word Cool. Like um, when I went to the job interview, I got a very cool reception from the committee, and I don't know if I got the job. Like these people were basically cold in that sense, and so that's drawing on the experience and the associations of coldness and frigidity and all of that. Okay, so denotative and connotative meaning, guys. Just a quick example. Even a word like home, which in its denotative sense would refer to like the domicile where someone resides. I guess if you had a happy home in your childhood, that could evoke all kinds of positive memories and associations of that kind. Um, that would go over and beyond the mere dictionary definition of home. Okay, so two types of meaning. Good enough. And then uh, after that, the book has some discussion of different um, types of definitions. So it goes over what are four, are four different types of definitions. <clears throat> Okay, so language is built out of words, and words have meanings, and that's why we talk about definitions. But there are different types, and so um, one mentioned by the book are stipulative definitions. So stipulative definitions, these are definitions that are given to new terms that appear in our language, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so um, one of the interesting things about language is how it's always changing. Even the same language undergoes significant change from generation to generation and across the centuries. Um, for example, right, an English speaker like me or you today, just speaking everyday English, um, would have an awkward encounter if we took a time machine back to, like, I don't know, uh, the, the era of Shakespeare, Elizabethan England and tried to speak with these people. This is English, and you guys, some of you maybe have studied some of those um, Shakespearean classics, but um, the manner of speech that was conventional and uh, at that time is far different from ours because many words that were then in fashion are no longer used commonly, and some words that we use today didn't exist back then. So language is always changing. Um, if you go even further back, some of you guys might have read the Canterbury Tales, and you know that that Middle English period also has further differences both phonetically and um, in terms of word uh, usage than, than common speech of English today. Um, I, I remember the opening parts of the Canterbury Tales in the Middle English, isn't it? Wanda to prill with his shoulder so to 
the drogt of marcha hat a persa to the rota, right? And that's very strange sounding, but it's just saying uh, when that April with his sweet showers has pierced the drought of March to the root. Um, but this is the same language which is evolving over time. So basically, why does language change? Because as I said, some words go out of usage, or at least common usage in many cases, and then other new words emerge in the language. In 100 or 200 years from now, maybe humanity survives, uh, there will be far different modes of common speech that exist then in comparison with the present day. So stipulative definitions are definitions that are given to the new words that start to pop up in language. And new words appear all the time, every year in a, in a given language. So let's ask now, what are some words that you can think of that did not exist even just like 100 years ago? So like your great grandparents or whoever, this word would not have meant anything to them because maybe it refers to technology that didn't exist back then, or maybe it refers to um, social conventions or customs that didn't exist back then. So let me know if anyone has a thought on this. New words, basically. Words that have only come into being recently. Okay, so like Instagram, right? The words that refer to any kind of like um, web-based app or whatever, of course, that's going to be totally uh, alien word to, to generations that didn't exist before the internet. I mean, Instagram, though, is, is a pretty specific reference, even just the word internet itself or or um, gigabyte, or um, yeah, iPhone, yeah. So you're using like technology and apps and stuff, that's fair. Sometimes it also has to do with cultural understandings. Like before the 70s feminist movement, um, well, no, actually, Nicole, I gotta say this, coronaviruses have existed for a long time. The COVID-19 is one kind of coronavirus, but there was also SARS COVID. Uh, and so it's, it, coronavirus is actually have existed for a long time, but if you mean COVID-19, that's something different for sure. Um, it's a particular kind of coronavirus. If you get into the biology of these viruses, some of them are called coronaviruses because of the distinctive halo shape uh, that, that they appear to have under microscopic magnification. Um, but no, good example. There's medical procedures perhaps that didn't exist a long time ago. So like open heart surgery, this wouldn't have made sense at all to like a person living in Shakespeare's time. Um, what is an x-ray? What is a sonograph? What is a, um, you know, internal combustion engine, um, satellite? All in, all in all, we have a lot of words that couldn't have had any meaning in the past because the things they referred to didn't even exist at that time. So keep your mind uh, alert to the change of language over time. You know, you want to be a skilled user of language, so you have to pay attention to the lexicon, which is always shifting right underneath you a little bit. I try to stay updated on all the new lingo and everything so I can you know, talk with people of whatever age group. Um, but sometimes it takes a little bit of a deliberate effort. You know, A lot of older people, they don't pay attention to new words that come up and they start to sound a little dated. Uh, so, so that's something that you can pay attention to to be a skilled communicator and just um, you know, an impressive uh, vocabulary. Okay, so yeah, let me read a little bit from the book on this just to give you a quick look at what it says on it. <clears throat> we go chapter three. <clears throat> yeah, so um, <clears throat> dictionary definitions are only one type of definition. Other types include stipulative, theoretical, persuasive. A stipulative definition is one given to a new term, such as bites or decaf, like decaffeinated coffee. There's no way of removing the caffeine prior to more modern methods that we have now, so that's an example, or to a combination of old terms, so skyscraper, laptop, right? The word skyscraper wouldn't have meant anything to people living prior to the industrialization era and, you know, this kind of architectural achievement. Um, let's see, a stipulative definition may also be a new definition of an existing word, such as the addition of heterosexual to the definitions of the term straight. Yeah, prior to, like, more awareness and openness of, like, gay people, um, straight wasn't used as a term of reference to the to the heterosexual community because it was just kind of tacitly assumed that everyone, except for a tiny minority few, uh, were heterosexual. So that's another example. Stipulative definitions often start off as jargon or slang and are initially limited to a particular group of people. Young people may create their own terminology, such as the term sexting or whatever, as a way of distancing themselves from previous generations. Um, okay, so... 
The creation of new terms and stipulative definitions reflect also cultural and historical changes. Terms like date rape and sexual harassment were coined during the feminist movement in the 1970s to call attention to occurrences that were previously not considered noteworthy. Um, and also brand names, companies, Nike, you know, Adidas, whatever, Puma, well, Puma the animal has always been around, but in reference to clothing brands and stuff, that could be another case. Okay, so we have stipulative definitions now to add to our growing roster of concepts in chapter three. Um, after that, the next term mentioned are these theoretical definitions. That's pretty easy to define. Theoretical definitions are just the definitions of given to scientific terms. So, <clears throat> so sometimes the definition that we're interested in is something that has to do with scientific theory, and that's what the textbook labels the theoretical definition. Um, <clears throat> think of, for example, force, mass, gravity, acceleration, inertia, entropy. Any of these different concepts has a precise theoretical definition, and that's the kind of definition you would encounter in like a science class dedicated to that material or a science textbook, whether it's physics, chemistry, biology, or, or whatever the case may be. So um, these are used to explain the nature of scientific terms, they're cutting edge in a sense because they're going to reflect the most current consensus scientific theory of the of the phenomenon. Um, so I mean that one I think we can make pretty short work of it. I don't know if there's much more I can say about it in the book. Let's see. Um, yeah, theoretical definitions used to explain the nature of a scientific term. Um, these definitions are likely to be found in dictionaries for those disciplines such as the sciences. For example, alcoholism is defined theoretically as a chronic, progressive, and potentially fatal disease. Um, unlike a dictionary definition, which merely describes the symptoms or effects, the medical definition puts forth a theory regarding the nature of it and its causes. Okay, so that's one example. Moving on from the theoretical definitions, <clears throat> the next one were the stipulative definitions, right? Oh, no, sorry, I already covered that. Operational definitions, that's what I meant to say. So, operational definition. Okay, so an operational definition is when one uses a threshold or a boundary of some kind in order to create standardization in the use of a term. So, um... <clears throat> Okay, so um, think of a concept which is defined such that there is a boundary or a cutoff point above which the term does not apply and below which uh, the term does or vice versa. So as an example, everybody, um, what is the boundary or the cutoff point above which a person is considered driving under the influence? You guys, I'm sure, would know this since you've probably had to learn this for driving tests and stuff like that, or just from common knowledge. Does anybody know what I'm referring to? It's the boundary above which, above this limit, a person is determined to be too inebriated to drive. Who knows the number or the reference? <clears throat> Let me know. <clears throat> Driving under the influence, 0 0.08, that's right guys, 0 0.08, 0 0.08 of blood alcohol content. So um, could we have decided to make that limit slightly higher or lower? Yes, I mean, it could have been that we decided on a different rule of 0 0.09 or of 0 0.07. In fact, there are some states, I think like Utah, where it is lower, 0 0.05 or whatever. But let's just go with California state law, 0 0.08. Um, now, are some people 
the kind of people who say, I have a heavy tolerance. 0.08 is nothing to me. I'm a big person or whatever, and I can drive easy on 0.08, and I'm not that intoxicated. Some will say that. Are there other people who say something like, oh, I'm a lightweight, and if I even have like one sip of something, I could be 0.04, and I would be a little tipsy, and I wouldn't feel good to drive. Yeah, but we can't have a standard that's different for every person. There has to be a uniform standard under the law so we can all know exactly um, when the designation would apply to us. So we can't have it be that, well, to one person who feels sober at 0.10 and to a person who feels drunk at 0.05, it's just, it just kind of varies by the individual. We have to have a uniform standard. And so we invent this threshold according to which above it, that's the designation and below it, it's not. Let's ask for another example. Um, what about this? What's the threshold or boundary to be considered a legal adult? That's one I think everyone here should know. And let me know in the chat. In order to be considered an adult, we say, under our laws and stuff, that you must uh, be at what level of, um, well, you could, I don't want to give it away, so just let me know. What's the limitation or boundary above which one is an adult and below which they are not? 18 years old, correct. And there again, could we have decided on 19 or 17? Sure. There's nothing essential about the age of 18, but we just have to have a common uh, universal standard there. Um, now, are there some people who are up there in their 30s or even older who say, I feel like I'm really immature and I'm still not an adult? Yes. Are there some people who are very precocious and wise, you know, young uh, children, even teenagers who've, who are more mature than those older people? Yes. Uh, but we can't say that the age of adulthood depends on each individual and how mature they are relative to themselves. It has to be something universal so that we can all be held accountable to the same standards and rules. So we say it's 18. Um, and that's another operationally defined concept. The concept of adulthood is operationally defined as 18 years or above. The concept of driving under the influence is operationally defined as 0.08 or above. So now with those two examples, and we'll just we'll finish with this and we'll pick up um, at this point on Thursday. But can anyone here think of another example, perhaps, of a concept that is defined operationally like this? Uh, and the, the basic parameter is going to be something that's defined with a rule that says above a certain threshold, the term does apply or not below it. Um, so we said adult age, we said level of alcohol in a system to be too drunk to drive. Can you think of another threshold concept like this where there's a kind of a boundary above and below? Age to drink alcohol, that's fine, Violetta, yes. Um, 21 years old, in other countries it's 18, um, but in our country it's 21, and that's another thing that we could have stipulated to be a little higher or lower. Pre President of the United States age requirement, that's good, it's 35. Um, certainly we can imagine that had been moved up or down a little bit, but there has to be a uniform standard under the Constitution. So we say of 35, age to purchase a firearm, also fine, yes. But that kind of is in a way folded into the uh, age of adulthood criteria, but that's, that's a good reference too. Height requirement on a roller coaster, sure. The thing though is, um, being on the roller coaster is not really a concept to be defined in a sense, though. It's just like permission to get on the roller coaster. So that's a sort of a gray area, that case, in a way, if you understand what I mean. Let me give you another concept or a couple of examples just quickly. Um, do you know how poverty is defined in our economic system? Well, there's a federal and a state poverty line. And we say that if you have annual income, which is above this number, then you're not considered for whatever legal purposes to be a person in poverty. Um, I don't know the exact dollar amount that it is for the state of California or the federally, but I think it's definitely um, higher in California than it is federally, um, the, the poverty line. So that would be another one. How about obesity? One last example. Does anybody know the metric that is used to measure whether a person is or is not obese? We say it's determined by means of what metric? This is one that maybe some of you might know. Let's see. BMI, yes, body mass index. So body mass index is a measurement that can be given if you simply input your age, um, height, weight, and gender. I don't know if age is actually necessary. Sorry, no, just a height, weight, and gender. And the BMI number then is going to be a certain value. If it's above a certain numeric value, then that is qualified as being obese. And if it's below that same threshold, then the person's not obese for medical purposes. Um, some people 
you know, like people with an eating disorder that are like very thin may say, I feel like I'm fat, even though, you know, they're really thin. Another person may be a little heavier and they think, well, you know, I'm just kind of got a big frame and that's not, I'm not that big. But in the medical sense, we have to have a common standard that we can point to for everybody that doesn't differ from case to case. So BMI threshold gives us the clear definition of obesity. So those are operational definitions, everyone. When we pick up back on Thursday, we'll continue finishing off this note about two more types of definitions. I'll just speak about um, the, the persuasive ones. And then, um, and then we will talk a little bit about qualities of good definitions, different communication styles, and how rhetoric can be used to manipulate people. So that's it. We'll finish Chapter 3 on Thursday. We got through a pretty good part of it today. I guess for now then, I'll let you guys go and have a good rest of your day. Um, so is everybody good to go? Let me know in the chat if, um, if you're all good. And then I'll just close the stream. <clears throat> just making sure I like to check in right before. I don't, wanna, I don't like to close the stream before everyone got a chance to say goodbye. Okay, well, thanks again, everyone. Take it easy and have a good day. If you need anything in between now and um, Thursday, let me know, and I'll be in touch. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks.